back to the camera and go down there. <laughs> and I was with Roger last time. Do we just pick a partner? I don't think we're doing that this time. I think, do we draw names out of a hat to see who we're paired with? Okay, well, yes. Well, yes, you are. I already know what she told me. We'll call the meeting to order. Thank you for joining us this evening. And we're keeping our fingers crossed for a nice, dry, long week. Um, and with that, we'll take roll call. Uh, Madam President, we have four board members present. Mrs. Niles is unavailable this evening. Thank you very much. The pledge. Mrs. Freed's going to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We've got consent on the agenda. All in favor of supporting consent? Or may I get a motion? I'm going I'll, too quickly. I'll move to approve consent. Second. Second. Discussion? Yes. I just want to make uh, a quick note uh, of one item in the personnel report. Uh, one of my kids' favorite teachers, Mr. Tom Maxim, will be retiring this year. Uh, Tom's a kid at heart, which is why he connects so well with students. And I know my kids will be very unhappy to hear that uh, he's finally retired, but good for him. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Quickly moving on to our workshop. We have a wonderful workshop being provided by um, Mrs. Thornberry and Mr. Arthur. So we will go ahead and get started. We'll join down here and Dana's in a couple minutes. Dana's going to coordinate things for us. Oh my, is there a volume control? <laughs> I have a true voice. Okay. Good evening, everyone, um, members of the board, colleagues. Thank you for uh, stepping down to the table for our workshop. Um, as Mr. Backer told me a long time ago, um, when he sat on the board, I need to hold on to the, the podium so I don't move around. And I talk into the microphone. It's one of his first tips he gave me. Um, one of my first presentations, so I'll try and hold still so that you all can hear me. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the special services continuum um, and give you an update of where we are um, in terms of uh, a few very particular areas and give you some information um, that I hope is helpful um, as a result of the great decision you helped us make a few years ago um, in terms of pulling away and disaffiliating from the co-op and the things that we've been able to do as a result of that. So um, hopefully there's some great information that will make sense based upon what we talked about a few years ago. Um, before I get started, I want to introduce um, my two assistant directors, um, Linda Gibson. Stand up. 
and Tammy Thornberry will be joining here in a few minutes for a portion of the presentation. To get started, um, I want to talk about the, the goal that was set for, or goals I should say, that were set forth by the last special education um, instructional program evaluation. Um, this is what an exemplary program would be um, if we were back at the, at the table several years ago going through an, inst an instructional program evaluation. Um, we believe we're doing these things, and tonight um, we're going to provide you with some examples of several of these items. But I want to go through them very quickly. Um, all students attain skills necessary to maximize their potential. All staff implement evidence and research-based best practices. All students receive appropriate and challenging curricula. All students receive deliberate, timely, and systematic intervention with fidelity. All stakeholders believe that services meet student needs. All staff collaborate and share responsibility for student learning. All students receive continuity in their programming across schools and grade levels. And finally, all staff encourage parent involvement and input. So a few things I want to talk about briefly, just to kind of bring everybody to the same page, because these are things that I believe will come out during our presentation tonight and are important pieces of special education. Um, federal entitlement programs, which special education falls into that category. We're going to talk about service delivery, least restrictive environment, FERPA, which is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and the continuum of supports and services, which is what we'll focus on the most this evening. So, federal entitlement programs. I think it's important to point out um, to everyone um, that currently only about 17% of the special education federal mandate um, is funded by the, by the government, by the United States government. The rest of that, the rest of the um, other half or other part of that 17% is funded locally by general fund and other sources that are generated by the state of Indiana. Um, not a lot of money for a great deal of mandates. Um, you'll notice in the trends, 34% during the 2009 school year, that, that was the year that we had stimulus money and we doubled that 17% to 34. So that's the most the federal government has ever um, thrown into the pot to pay for special education services. Um, in our community, we're very lucky we have um, great support for our students. Um, stimulus dollars were instrumental in changing special education in Carmel. Um, that one-time money was a major boost in terms of our instructional specialist and bringing a lot of, of great su support for professional development for our staff. Disability eligibility requirements must be met, so that's a component of all entitlement programs. Um, compliance expectations regularly measured and critiqued. We spend a lot of time, as our teachers will attest, um, to making sure that we're compliant and we're following all the, the rules and regulations that are set forth um, under this particular entitlement program. And finally, funds can be retracted for noncompliance. So while 17% doesn't seem like a lot, it's quite a few positions and quite a few services. So we certainly don't want to ever lose that money. So as we move into service delivery, service delivery be begins with appropriate evaluation and identification of students with disabilities. So as we think about the special education process, this is the first step. Um, we're, we're trying to find students who have disabilities um, or students come to us from physicians or outside sources. Um, and we test them. And so we go through the evaluation process. Case conferences are held. Um, case conference is the meeting in which we determine what those services are that that particular student needs. The blue blueprint for each student is called the IEP, the Individualized Education Plan, um, which many of you are very familiar with. And services are identified and implemented based upon this annual plan. Those services are very different from student to student in many cases. So we need to look at our service delivery model in a, in a very um, dynamic way. Least restrictive environment. Um, as I do training with staff, I often say to them, the easiest way to remember the definition for least restrictive environment is where's the student sitting to get their instruction? Where's the main place that they're being instructed? Um, the, legalese, or the, legal, the federal definition, a student who has a disability should have the opportunity to be educated with non-disabled peers to the greatest extent possible, excuse me, greatest extent appropriate. They should have access to the general ed curriculum or any other program that non-disabled peers would be able to access. And the key here being the word appropriate. And, and that, quite honestly, is um, a, a very important term in special education. FERPA. <clears throat> important reason to understand FERPA in terms of special education is that um, this evening we're going to talk about, we're going to sort of um, tighten the scope as we go through the evening. And I want to make sure that we're very careful as a staff that we're not violating FERPA. Um, so we won't be talking about any specific students or any specific um, schools or those kinds of things we'll be talking pretty generally so that we're not violating, violating any student rights. Um, but FERPA is federal law that protects the privacy of student educational records and identity. The law applies to all schools that receive federal funds under the applicable programs of the U.S. Department of Education. 
again, special education being one of those entitlement programs. Generally, schools must have written per permission from the parent or eligible student in order to release any information from a student's educational record. We say a student, because if a student's 18 or older, the, their rights, it becomes their right to give us permission versus their parent. So, continuum of support. So, I'll turn things over to Ms. Gibson. All schools that receive federal funding or federal entitlement funds are obligated to provide a full continuum of services for all students meeting special education eligibility. In Carmel Clay Schools, in the next um, couple of slides, I'm going to show you how we provide that continuum of services. The continuum of support must range from age three in our early childhood all the way through the year of the child's 22nd um, birthday. Programming and supports must meet the needs of all students meeting the eligibility requirements. Service delivery must be met at the level of least restrictive environment, which Jay just um, spoke of. And then students' needs are met both through our, our students' needs are met both through both vertical and horizontal frameworks across the district. So to give you a visual of that. We're going to talk about academic supports. If you look at the vertical line, I know, I think you'll be able to hear me, but we're talking, again, we offer services as early as their third birthday, and we go through um, the year of their 22nd birthday. And on this side of the continuum, as far as academic support, we start at consultation and resource support, and that resource can either be um, in the general education classroom, pushing services in, to pull out services um, in resource. And we move along this um, continuum and are most restrictive academically are our, our intense supports and programming, which we have several um, self-contained programs such as our early childhood program, our functional academics program, is, which is um, a program right below resource that services our mild cognitive disabled students our life skills program, which um, services our moderate students, and our FIATS program, which um, services our um, severe, um, severely disabled students. So academically, students, those grade levels can go from this side to this side. It's all done individually through case conferences. And one of the things as we narrow our focus tonight, we'll be talking about collaborative problem solving. We use the process of collaborative problem solving um, through our academic supports as well as our behavioral supports. You'll see the same visual for behavioral supports, again, as early as third grade or early childhood, all the way up through the um, year of their 22nd birthday. On one side of the continuum, again, we're talking about consultation and resource support, whether it be in general education classrooms or pull out through our resource program. And then as we move this way on the continuum, we're talking about, um, for our behavioral supports, we have some internal self-contained programs where at um, certain magnet sites in our district, um, we have um, gen ed with intense support for students with um, behavior concerns, may be in the general education classroom that have um, lots of supports wrapped around the students in the gen ed classroom or they may be in fully self-contained classroom where they're getting their educational supports. Then um, once we have exhausted all of our internal um, supports, then we have other things that we can look at, whether it's a day treatment program or a residential program. And we have students in Carmel Clay schools that are um, in various um, places on this continuum of services for behavior. So we move on to a visual, um, just to give you a, a brief reminder of where we were a few years ago. This was um, prior to disaffiliation from the co-op. On the left-hand side, and this may be a familiar si slide to those of you that were here at that time, on the left-hand si side, you'll see the things that Carmel Clay Schools has um, been providing for years um, as a standalone district, or as a district that was um, providing standalone services alongside a co-op structure. On the right-hand side, you'll see the services that the, co the cooperative was providing. Um, and while certainly the list looks small, those are some pretty significant programs on the right hand <coughs> side um, under co-op that were, again, those past programs that were provided. Um, just to mention a few, life skills, fiats, mosaics, um, they, were, they would oversee OTs and PTs, psychological services, or itinerant teachers, which are blind low vision, 
um, deaf, hard of hearing teachers. Um, early childhood assessment team, not, not the early childhood program, but just the assessment team. Um, and several other things that are more administrative. So a little bit of a different visual. Um, these first two columns, we'll have to look at this a little bit differently. Um, these first two columns are now what Carmel Clay Schools is providing. And then the far right column is the HBM column to represent that we're no longer receiving any services from that structure any longer. So in the left hand column for the most part, these were things that we were already providing um, that are grayed out in the first three in the second column. The items that are bold and, in, and are in italics are items that we've been able to add as a result of the decision that we made um, in July of 2012 or when the, the switch actually happened. I do want to take a second and read these because I think they're really important um, to point out what we have added. And this is just a, a, a snapshot of a, of a few things. Many other things aren't even listed. Um, student specific equipment and technology. So as a result of pulling away from the co-op, we've been able to um, really drill down and, and have control over what types of technology and pieces of equipment that we need to buy for specific students and do that in a lot quicker fashion. Um, Orton Gillingham training, um, we were able to do Orton Gillingham training for the district um, this last summer. Um, that put a, about 20 of our staff um, in a pretty good position across our elementaries and middle schools to be able to provide Orton Gillingham um, um, support uh, to our students who have um, issues with reading. Um, Expansion of evidence-based practices teams. I think all of you have probably either heard of or you've at least seen during the expedition um, or during presentations we've done over the last five or six years in this room. Um, the OSEP grant that we received for Creekside originally, which we started with the autism-based practices. This is what I'm referring to when I say evidence-based practices because we've expanded that across the district. Every building has evidence-based practices training and every building is um, implementing those pieces. <coughs> Tonight we're going to focus in on collaborative problem solving in a few minutes and it's very similar to evidence-based practices in what we're trying to do. Just kind of make a comparison there for something that you're very aware of. Um, we've increased behavior and autism support personnel. We've increased both OT and PTs in the district. We've increased school psychology services. This is a very helpful thing I think to most of our schools in that um, all schools have at least a half-time school psychologist or three of our schools, our title buildings, have a full-time school psychologist. So that was a pretty significant change from what we were, were receiving before. Increase in itinerant services, addition of dedicated assistive technology specialists. So we have somebody who her full-time job is to understand the latest tech, assistive technology and making sure that we have that in the right hands of the right uh, staff to make sure our students are successful. Addition of an instructional coach for life skills in the functional academics program. And addition of a lead clinician to oversee all of our clinical services and make sure that we're um, up to speed in professional development in that area. We have added a dedicated mental health therapist, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, who is specific to our intense behavior programs. Um, our kids that we typically would have um, maybe seen at Mosaics, this individual is supporting those types of students. Um, in addition of a child services specialist who helps us with um, keeping our hand out in the community um, in reference to mental health services and making sure we have those connections for our kids who need to be placed um, quickly um, when there are issues that arise in families and those kinds of things. Um, and finally, intervention materials. It's really nice to be able to have cash flow, be able to buy intervention materials for our students like that when we need it versus waiting months on end. So some pretty significant things have happened um, and some supports have gone into place as a result of this decision. So I want to thank you um, for your support. So as we kind of narrow a little bit, um, as I talked about, we've done evidence-based practices with many of you and you've, or you've seen it during expedition. Um, I want to talk about district-wide collaborative problem solving and what this approach is. Um, as Linda mentioned earlier on the continuum, it's used for determining specific academic interventions. Pardon me. Used for determining specific behavioral interventions. So far, Prairie Trace, Collegewood, Orchard Park, Forestdale, and Carmel Elementary, as well as Creekside Middle and Carmel Middle and Carmel High School have all received the training. And so, um, we certainly will continue to expand that training in each of these buildings, but the, all of these buildings have minimal training um, with a, uh, at least a cadre of staff. And this is also how we started with the evidence-based practices training. Um, so we're sort of following the same model. Um, we have six elementary buildings that will be trained in February. So here we are in February. Um, at the end of this month, we can add, um, we'll have all 11 buildings taken care of in terms of training at, at the elementary level. And then the remaining school will be trained in September, our um, third middle school. With that being said, um, our spotlight for this evening, we kind of get into some of the, um, what's hopefully more interesting to you, some more hands-on, um, is our focus on the intense behavior 
continuum. Um, planning for students with significant behavioral concerns began about two years prior to us dis disaffiliating. So we began talking about, we have these students who are, um, who are manifesting some pretty significant behavior, um, are off-site, some of them, some of them were within our buildings, um, but we were questioning what is it that we're going to do to make sure that we're supporting these students um, as we transition away from the co-op, if that were what we were going to do. That was the conversation we were having at the time. Um, we automatically upped our crisis prevention and intervention training, which basically CPI is, uh, is um, an approved um, approach for de-escalating behavior. Um, and so we have increased that number significantly across the district of people who are, are trained. Um, teachers and staff were hired one year in advance of the disaffiliation to ensure a significant transition period for students at Mosaics. So what we did was we created the four sites across the district. We hired those teachers a year ahead of time before the students even came. And those teachers were instrumental in helping us design what the classrooms needed to look like, what supports needed to be in place, and all that was based upon them spending time at Mosaics with those few students that were there and the other students in the district that we felt like might need to have this program as a support. Physical changes were made to the four schools a year prior, um, thanks to Mr. Farron and, and Roger's help. Um, we were able to get that done pretty quickly. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we were able to dedicate an MSW to this program to really, to really support and provide one-on-one -on -one therapy to the students who are in this program um, right on the spot. Given that, I'm going to turn things over to Ms. Thornberry. They gave me a lavalier mic because I'm not nearly as good at standing still as Jay is. So, <laughs> um, One of the things that um, we talk about a lot from a best practice um, research-based perspective is the lens that we look at kids through, which is kids do well if they can. Um, and we look at that, we look at kids through that lens both academically um, and behaviorally. And really, if you think about it, um, we look at ourselves as adults through that lens. We all do well if we can, because doing well is preferable. Nobody wants to not do well. Nobody wants to look bad in front of their peers or their colleagues or the people around them. And so if kids aren't doing well, then it is um, our responsibility to determine why they aren't doing well and then design interventions to help them reach their potential, both academically and behaviorally. And if you'll recall, about a year ago, Mrs. Seaver and Mrs. Arroyo uh, and I came to a workshop and we talked about our three tiers of academic intervention and what that cycle looked like and all the things that we put in place to make sure that our students who weren't doing well academically um, had the things in place um, that they needed in order to succeed academically. And so tonight we're going to focus a little bit more on the behavior intervention piece, the things that we put in place to help students behaviorally. Um, the way I liken it when I talk to staff and, and honestly when we talk to parents is if our students can't read, um, if our students don't do well at math, we don't say to someone, well, I just, I just need you to read that. Just read it. I don't understand. Just read it. I don't understand. Or if they're failing math tests, we don't just say, stop failing the math test. We build academic interventions in place to bridge those lagging skills that students have so that they can become more successful academically. And behaviorally, we take that exact same approach. Um, we look at students, we determine what their lagging skills are, um, and then we help build those skills to help them do well. Um, you have in front of you an article by Dr. Ross Green. Um, this is um, just representative of his work, um, Lives in the Balance. Really what this is all about is changing the conversation about and with behaviorally challenging children. So I'm going to ask you with your partner um, just to read your section of this article. Um, it is numbered, and then your section of the article is actually also marked with um, start and stop. So the idea is for you to read your section. If you would also read just the very first page, it's just kind of a brief overview. Um, and if you would read your section, and then once you read your section, remember, no one else is reading that same section. So it's going to be important that you can, one, just briefly summarize your section, but two, be able to offer an aha and an aha uh -huh to your colleagues. So thinking about your aha, which is, wow, I hadn't really thought about it like that, and your aha, uh -huh, which is absolutely, makes perfect sense. I've thought about that like that a lot. So I'll give you a few minutes to read your section of the article, um, and then we will have you share with your colleagues. Oh, <laughs> for those of you in the audience, I know Linda passed it out, but you also can take a picture of the QR code or go to um, this website and the article is 
available there as well. you finish your section if you want to get with your partner and come up with a brief summary and then an aha and aha that you want to share with your group. I, I feel like I ring the closer to your microphones I get, so I don't know if I'm going to pull a chair back here. So. 
<laughs> we're not all ringing. <laughs> or it may just be my imagination. <laughs> So far, has told me. I want to believe it because otherwise I'm wasting my life. I hear you there. So, uh, yeah. but I, I don't know how to fix that. Why? Can't be involved. Well, that's. I don't know how to address the insult problem. Well, we got a lot going on. That's that's the challenge. You know. I think I think the identification of the predictability is by far the you know that's that's just paying attention that's mm -hmm. the easy part right um, once you focus in on that you should you know, just break down every time you know sooner or later you go every time you go to bed they tell you that well that's you know, you that. why <laughs> what's the problem that was that take a long I was told that she basically Fear and love. Most of these things, most things that manifest itself in an inappropriate behavior, major emotions. Fear. So, 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 we, so what, what you and I do is we get this man. Sometimes, you know, there's this. If you want to wrap up your thoughts, it looks like people are starting to wind down. So if you want to wrap up your thought, it looks like everybody's starting to wind down. So be ready to share with your colleagues a brief summary of your section and your aha and your aha. Maybe aha is our behavioral situations are predictable. I think I think once you see that, it doesn't make sense. No, you don't have to do that. It's just a two-way life travel. Not that it's not that it's bad to get here, but they just do six or 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 six. I wish that's all it took. All right, we'll start with Mrs. Hackett and Dr. Wall. Okay. Well, I believe we had the first, the first section, and um, interestingly enough, the t two different, um, two different aspects of the article section popped up for both of us, and it was exactly the same. So then we had to kind of fit it into the aha and aha. Uh -huh. 
Um, but I'll kind of go backwards. The second, well, I'll say the aha first. Um, there's a sentence that says, if you don't know what skills a kid is lacking, they probably won't get taught. And that puts the emphasis on the instructor to, um, to really delve into what are those specific behaviors. Not what is a label, not what category you fit in, but what is that student's particular behaviors. Then you go from there. It, then it lists um, kind of, how, you know, examples of how to focus in on that. But that led us to our aha. In the past, we kind of went for the diagnosis. That was, as Dr. Wall said, that was your first step. Let's, let's get this diagnosed. Let's figure out where the student is. And then our work is done. And then you go from there. When actually, that was our aha. Uh -huh. Well, the diagnosis is really a label. It helps with federal funding. But it doesn't help you with those day, the day behaviors and help that child learn the next behavior, the better behavior. That's where we were. Thank you. Dr. Dudley, Mrs. Merriman. So the section we read talked about when students are frustrated, they're disorganized with their thoughts, um, they have difficulty putting their thoughts in a coherent pattern, problem solving, they get frustrated and so then things start to escalate. We're expecting our students to do higher order problem solving when they're upset and they can't do it so they become impulsive and the first thing they do is come up with the first solution. It's impulsive and they put their worst foot forward versus their best decision. Um, the other one of the ahas that kind of popped out is that when our students are acting upwards, you know, requesting them to talk through it, talk to me, what's going on, tell me what's going on, and the students cannot put into words what's problem, problem, um, causing them problems. So we have to then have them think about what they're doing. Um, sometimes they don't resort to using the best words, and they choose poor words with that impulsivity. And so when we think about our students, um, we look at some language processing concerns, and they can't put their thoughts together. And um, so then we start assessing, and some of our tools that we're using are not sensitive enough to even pick up on some of the language processing disorders. We're yet, though, when we might assess them to look for that, we might identify no weaknesses at all. And another piece of our um, aha, as where it talked, there was a one little section, I know later on in the article it talks more about the consequences, but it talks about the consequences and how if we just have just very um, formal consequences, we're not teaching the students what it is that we want them to do. And with our students that are having difficulty with problem solving, they're just adapting and they're surviving, but they're making very poor choices. And those consequences are not necessarily going to teach them what it is that we need for them to do. Thank you. Mr. Newman, Mrs. Freed. I guess Mrs. Freed wants me to talk, which I'll do. <laughs> but if you have something to add, please take the microphone away from me. <laughs> um, we identified a, a couple of ahas, um, and at least, um, I guess a couple of ahas too. And the first thing, uh, and I like Dr. Dudley had read this article uh, just recently, and, but something different jumped out at me today. I guess I had a different section too, so that makes good sense. But um, tagging, uh, kind of following up on what Maggie shared, um, the difficult, the lagging skill, if you if you will, for some of these children and perhaps for some of ourselves sometimes, as I read this and think about me, um, <laughs> it's how to put your emotions on the shelf uh, so as to be able to think rationally. And I think, as a parent, I definitely feel this way sometimes. I don't give enough credit to the importance of being able to do that. Uh, it's not a, a choice behavior that the child's making. Maybe they don't know what else to do. Um, and that just kind of jumped at me. Um, and we also, um, what, what really jumped out at me as a good uh, kind of visual is that sometimes these students are black and white thinkers stuck in a gray world. Um, and while our world is black and white in a lot of ways, probably more so it's gray. Um, and that's very difficult for a black and white thinker um, or, or learner uh, to operate in that world where they're unsure of what's right, what's wrong. Uh, what's expected, what's not expected, um, and um, so what they what these children sometimes do is struggle to apply concrete rules and interpretations to a world where few such rules apply. They're not sure what to do. And finally, this one spoke to me as a parent. Um, can these children be helped to think more flexibly? And and the author says, most definitely. 
so long as the adults realize that it's hard to teach kids to be more flexible by being inflexible themselves. So many times, I'll give my son one choice, do it my way. And that probably doesn't help me, help him. Mr. McMichael. Ditto. Oh, okay. Ditto. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. I'm still taking notes. <laughs> uh, the portion that we read um, noted that, focused on the fact that behind every challenging behavior there's an unsolved problem or a lagging skill. I think that was probably the aha portion of it. Once you understood that, then understanding that what you're trying to identify then is, is the problem that they're having. And you're now focused on that rather than the behavior that they're manifesting. And because, as we all know, you know, you may react to behavior in a way that's as though they're choosing to do that, just to be mean or to be rude or whatever the case might be. But if you look at it from the eye that they're reacting that way because they have an unsolved problem and their skills are lagging, you're in a much better position to try to help them with that. Well, I, what you said, you know, ditto that as our aha, that behind every challenging <laughs> behavior is an unsolved problem. But when we delve into this, it's um, once we've identified that lagging skill, we've identified the why of their challenging behavior, and then the next step is we need to identify the who, what, where, and why, or when, or how to which we don't know that answer. <laughs> so we're hoping number five can help us identify <laughs> how to solve the unsolved problem. Maybe not. You go first? I'm up first. Okay. Uh, the, the article, um, putting all of it together and tying it all together. <laughs> you now understand that uh, our, our aha, by the way, we'll start there. It's the very end of our article. It says the author's view is that what kids need is not more consequences, but what they need is an adult who understands what's causing them to act the way that they're acting. That together with what you guys have presented, that makes sense. Then our aha uh -huh was the author lists three sets, three series of consequences. And I, I kind of saw those as a stair step. You start with the beginning where you say, you know, your behavior is very poor and I don't like it, and here's how I want you to behave. And you're sure that that's going to work. And then when it doesn't, <laughs> You know, I, I can I can commiserate with Mr. Newman. I have little ones at home too. So, and when that doesn't, then you go to the next step, and you apply uh, another set of consequences that really don't make any sense because they're not tied to the behavior at all. Go to your room. I'm going to take away your TV. I'm taking away your electronic devices. What else did I do this weekend? And, um, okay. So, and then that doesn't work. And so then you really get mad and then you come up with a bunch of artificial things that don't have anything at all to do with the situation, mainly because you've become frustrated and angry with your child because the first two weren't working. And as we, if we reflect back on the article, we realize that what was it that was said, the child really doesn't understand why they're acting that way. They're just frustrated themselves, and so they're just acting out, out of frustration. What we really need to do is help them understand that. And we need to start, as Ryan said, to be able to put that up on the shelf and put it away sometimes. So. Well, I certainly agree with everything that Dr. Dillon has to say. He uh, did an excellent job of summarizing our piece. Um, the first thing that uh, came to me was that I did not understand the concept of lagging skills because I started at the end of the article, and of course lagging skills was discussed at the beginning of the article. So I flipped back and I looked through the list and I discovered that I, I'm guilty of, of a number of those lagging skills myself, so I can hardly hold it against a kid. And I also saw my uh, grandson, uh, who's uh, mildly autistic, and, and I'm thinking that uh, even if a, an adult knows the lagging skill for my grandson, he's not going to be able to just you know flip a switch and make that kid come along. Uh, it's a tougher nut to crack than uh, with, with a person on the spectrum than otherwise. And the other very happy revelation to me was that uh, I'm sitting next to the Director of Student Services, who has expressed a very finely nuanced uh, 
perspective on student discipline. I'm very happy to, to see that happen so that you know, he understands the, uh, the difficulties and the importance of penetrating behind the apparent behavior to help that kid either academically or behaviorally. So. Awesome, thank you. Um, the article really lays a nice foundation um, to talk about why do students um, struggle behaviorally. And um, we think about that traditional lens and oftentimes as you all um, so eloquently put it, that traditional lens is often how we as parents have operated. Um, our kids are unmotivated or attention seeking or manipulative or they push our buttons or they test our limits. Um, that often has been how organizations and care providers and parents and schools have looked at students. And when we look at the best practice lens, we look at the research-based lens, we shift why we believe students struggle behaviorally. And we really start thinking about that idea that students lag, lack critical cognitive skills and flexibility and adaptability, frustration tolerance and problem solving. And then we start to think about how do we teach those skills. Um, one of the most important realities we talk to about staff, and honestly we do parent workshops as well, um, one of the most important realities we touch on is challenging students are not always challenging. Um, and we think about that with our own kids as well. They're not challenging from the time they walk in the door until the time they leave. Oftentimes there are really bright spots in a challenging student's day. Um, we call that the clash of the two forces when they are challenging. And so we think about it when the demands and expectations of the situation outstrip someone's ability to deal with that. Um, and if you think about it, it happens to us as adults as well. So you think about those times you've been in a situation where the demands or expectations of that situation suddenly outstripped your ability to deal with it. And that can sometimes create a challenging episode for you as well. I think, Ryan, you kind of referred to that at home over the weekend where maybe that had happened. And, um, as I was talking to some people last, last week, I laughed about, you know, normally you get up, you come to work, you, you know, stop and get coffee or a Diet Coke or whatever, it's no big deal, you get here. But the morning that you get up and your kids are running late and they're having some challenging episodes and you get in the car and you realize, mm, I should have gotten gas last night. And you, get, and you get to the gas station and you get gas and you go in to get your Diet Coke and you want some Mentos and mm, they're out. And then you start suddenly realizing my kids have made me a little bit late and I had to pump gas and I'm late and they don't have Mentos and I'm going to be really irritated today if they don't have Mentos. Um, and it's those moments where you, know, you slam the car door, you want to kick the tire, you may say um, some adult words and you're grateful that no one is around you during that challenging episode. And I think about some of our students who find themselves in that position at school and there's a room full of adults or a room full of kids. And so this is a wonderful reality to remind our staff of and a wonderful lens um, to look at our challenging students through. Um, I know I heard um, Mr. McMichael and Mrs. Spannenberg talking about the last one. Challenging episodes are highly predictable. When you start looking through the lens of what are the lagging skills, when are students challenging, um, then you start really getting down to the point where I might be able to predict when this challenging episode might happen. I might be able to be proactive about preventing a challenging episode. Even if a student doesn't have the skill yet, even if I'm in the process of teaching it, I might be able to proactively prevent that challenging episode because I now know when to predict that that challenging episode might happen. This is what we do with our staff when we think about challenging kids. And we talked about those four questions. Mrs. Spanenberg talked about that. Why is this challenging kid challenging? When are they challenging? What are they doing? But then we ask that ultimate question with our staff as we work with students like this. What are we going to do about it now that we've addressed those three questions? And this is really where that collaborative problem solving process comes in. Um, we work, the behavior team goes out, or I go out, or, or someone goes out and helps a staff and a, and a group of adults work through those questions and then start thinking about how can we collaboratively problem solve those lagging skills. Many of our challenging students have a really long list of lagging skills. And so then the next thing we need to really do is prioritize, prioritize those lagging skills. We're not going to fix 15 things at once. So what are the key, critical, most important things we're going to address for second and third? What are the things we might proactively put aside for now? Um, and what are the things that 
don't belong in either one of those categories, but are really the things that are a matter of extreme safety that have to be addressed no matter what. We then begin those interventions to bridge that gap from where the kiddo is to where they can be to maximize their potential. One of the things we really focus on is realizing that interventions take time to work. And they also take time in order to durably solve that problem. So it doesn't happen overnight, it doesn't happen in a week. Um, sometimes it takes a really long time to solve those problems and to durably solve those problems. Um, we're going to finish with um, the video that we actually begin our staff workshops with. Um, as you all have talked about tonight, this is, a, this is a little bit of a paradigm shift a lot of times um, because we want kids to do, you know, we're the adults, we, want, we know the right thing to do, we want them to do it. And so as we begin that paradigm shift um, with the adults we work with, we show this video at the beginning of our trainings. And I think um, after you see it, you will understand why. Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over! This is the lighthouse, mate. It's your call. Hello? <laughs> Oftentimes, our students who struggle the most are the lighthouses in our lives. We're the USS Montana. By golly, I am the second largest fleet in this Navy, and you will move. And our most challenging kids say, mm, yeah, no, but I'm the lighthouse. I'm not moving. And so that's when we really come around that kid, come around that family, come around that building, and work together to collaboratively problem solve that and to durably change um, that child's behavior, but really deep down to durably change that kid's life forever, because we're in the business of education, um, and that's what we're here to do. So if you have questions, comments, Mr. Arthur would be happy to stand back up, and we would be happy, <laughs> we would be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. I actually, I actually do have a couple questions. Um, this is very enlightening, I have to say. Thank you. When we talk about our challenged children, our most challenged children, um, as parents, I guess we'd say all of our children are challenged sometimes. Um, and we talk about the case conference process and a group of people determining what is the best programming for that child, especially that year. Could you talk through a little bit what happens um, mid-year when it looks like there needs to be a course change or a programming change. How does, how does that process work? How, how quickly can you, I guess, turn those 15 degrees? Sure. Um, in special education, case conferences happen much more regularly than even once a year for most of our kids. Um, I would say, as an average across the district, as I look at um, case conferences that occur, if you look at the total population of students, we have about three per student a year which seems like a lot. Um, some kids we have four or five, six, because we need to. Um, many we only have one a year, but that's about the average. It's about three per student um, when you really average it out. So um, we're not afraid to have case conferences when things um, arise and, and deal with issues that need to be dealt with in terms of changing our instruction or changing the supports that we need to put in place for students. Um, and a, a huge part of that too is um, sometimes just communicating with families and understanding both ways what, what's going on, what's happening at school, what's happening um, at home. And so it, it can happen very quickly. Um, it doesn't have to be something that waits until mid-year. It really just depends on the circumstances for each student. Okay, that's, that's excellent. That's excellent. Um, I guess along that line, too, um, you, you talked at the very beginning about crisis prevention intervention, mm -hmm. crisis prevention intervention, CPI training. Mm -hmm. 
for some of the more extreme behaviors that we never want to happen but sometimes happen, how have we coordinated that training with, let's say, the Carmel Police Department or other um, officials in our speak to that. <laughs> I'll speak to that. Um, the, the Carmel Police, CPI is, a, um, is an organization that works with facilities and educators um, to train their staff in how to de-escalate and appropriately respond to a crisis. Um, police departments are trained in their own ways. Um, we work very closely with our SROs um, and, the, and um, the Karma Police Department, those SROs that serve on that, and they're an integral part of our team. Um, but if they're responding to a crisis, they are not using CPI methods. They're using police-approved methods to respond to that crisis. And so was there a coordination involved, I'm assuming, if, if the Carmel Clay Schools is using one set of methods and other organizations, police department, let's say, are using others. It's and really the we're still on a continuum of providing services. It is a continuum, and we're really talking about the difference between um, facilities and law enforcement. Law enforcement has a very different uh, a very different approach. They're they're not CPI trained because they're they're trained in a law enforcement approach. We're not law enforcement. We wouldn't be trained in that manner. But yes, it's a continuum. Um, and we coordinate with them while we're trained differently. Okay, and then my other question, my last question is probably much more simple. You talked about that there's now a dedicated mental health specialist, mm -hmm. or LCSW, I believe you had done there. How is that job description different than a behavioral specialist? Um, significantly different in that the person who's the LCSW or MSW, depends on how you kind of look at their certification, but um, master's and a licensed clinical social worker, all kind of the same thing in the situation. Um, this individual is providing direct therapy, so therapy that a family would go out and ascertain on their own after, you know, in evening hours, et cetera. We're able to provide that during the school day in addition to what they might be getting on the outside. And so that person works very closely um, with that family and their outside therapist in many cases to make sure that we're not doing things differently here therapeutically um, that they might be doing on the outside or vice versa. Um, when we think of a behavior consultant, that's somebody who, which is a different type of position that we have in the district, um, they're going into a particular school where a student might be exhibiting a, um, an initial behavior that is not acceptable um, and, needs some, and teachers or staff might need some uh, modeling or support on what to do with that student and how to sort of guide them in a different direction. Um, but they're not providing, the behavior support person is not providing therapy, per se. Okay, thank you. You know, this is extremely interesting as a former special education mm -hmm. teacher. Um, I love this stuff. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. So much great information being shared in really educating all of us as to what you do and how you go about doing it. And you're doing it quite well. My question for you pertains to the extra support we have in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So the least restrictive environment might be a typical classroom. But if the students are exhibiting certain behaviors, are we educating the students as well, their, their peers, to be supportive? And I mean, we, we're helping the teachers, but how do we help facilitate a, a more conducive environment for the for those students? Um, the behavior consultants and the autism consultants work closely with the building and the teacher and the administration and the parent um, to really dive into that problem. Um, we have multiple different peer awareness programs that we do in classrooms um, with students who may be in a classroom with someone who has some challenging behaviors. Um, that also is always very dependent on parent permission, would never address that without parent permission. And so um, we work closely together with the building and the parents to make sure. And then there's always that question, is the student in the room or not in the room while we're doing all of that? So we coordinate all of that. But yes, we have multiple different kinds of peer awareness programs. Thank you. There's a very important uh, book, the DSM-5. Yes. I think it's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Yes. They, they've changed the, the ground rules for how we diagnose autism. Mm -hmm. now, what, what kind of an impact is that having on Carmel Clay schools, if any? Um, so far, we're not really seeing a significant impact. Um, 
as of yet, Indiana has not adjusted their definition in Article 7 as it compares to what the DSM-5 is, is suggesting it should be or saying that it is. Um, there's been a lot of conversation at state conferences. Um, Kathy Pratt out of IU um, has spoken several times, and she's sort of a nationally known person in the area of autism. Um, so it's, it's been um, pretty eye-opening to hear her speak of what other states are attempting to do and where they're headed in terms of um, honoring that DSM criteria for what it for exactly how it's written, um, Indiana is a little bit behind in that. And so we're not necessarily seeing a lot of significant change yet. Um, the place that we're seeing significant change in our district is, and uh, in fellow districts around us in Hamilton County, really has to do with the insurance business and, and lack of support for people with autism. And families that are currently in, you know, might be, you know, at age three, four, and five choosing to put their child in a um, some sort of behavioral center or some sort of autism support center and the funding falls out from under and now all of a sudden what can public school do to help um, and so that's really what we're seeing at this point in terms of our students who are on the spectrum which may or may not be related to the DSM piece I'm not sure Kevin? I would just like to commend you and all the people that work with you for the fine job that you do because I think we do all believe that kids do well mm -hmm. if they can and um, having been a former teacher and seen you guys in action I know that you're there to serve the students and I know that you help my son and mm -hmm. other people's children and I believe that that is our goal and our mission at Carmel Clay Schools is to make sure these kids can do their job thank you so thank you thank you questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Gibson, Mrs. Thornberg, and Mr. Arthur. I know there are a couple couple people who have a few words to share. Mm -hmm. Trisha, would you like to begin? Thank you, Layla. I, I just wanted to um, make a report on a recent seminar attended. A big thank you to the taxpayers for allowing Dr. Wall Mr. Newman and myself to attend the Indiana School Board Association and Indiana Association of Public School Superintendent Collective Bargaining Seminar last Friday. It was held in Carmel, so travel wasn't a problem. Um, this annual seminar provides key updates to current collective bargaining law, including up-to-date guidance um, from the Indiana Department of Education, the Indiana Board of Accounts, the Indiana Education Employment Relations Board, or IERB, education law attorneys, and then there were several um, Indiana superintendents who spoke about their experiences in their district, um, things they might do differently, things they were glad they, they collaborated and did they, the way they did. I looked at all the information from the seminar and really came up with four key points um, that I took from that that are really, really important key points. The first, that certain areas of Indiana's new bargaining law have been further clarified through recent IERB and court rulings. But it was the, the feeling that um, there are certain areas that still need to be clarified and we need to look um, together and look at those, those items because it, there are still some areas that aren't totally clear. Second, a, new, a part of this um, new law, a couple years old now, was really to emphasize an increase in transparency for anyone who's involved in the bargaining process, whether it be teachers, teacher association leaders, administrative um, administrators of the district, school board members, um, parents, and the people in our community, it doesn't matter, to make it trans the whole process more transparent. Uh, IERB is taking a huge step in this direction by making available Gateway. Gateway is an online collective bargaining reporting site. All districts in Indiana are being encouraged to um, upload certain documents related to bargaining so that um, the information that's um, district salary and benefits in the contract, how much those cost to the district, um, tax rates, those kind of things would be accessible to everyone involved. I don't know where we are in this process. I think it's a pretty um, from, the, from what was presented, it sounds like it's a new initiative that's just getting underway. But, but it really emphasizes that the whole bargaining law is a transparency emphasis, working together. 
Third, uh, the point was made very clear that the new bargaining law has significantly changed the main role of school boards throughout the state in, during collective bargaining. Our role is really to prioritize the legal requirement that a proposed contract does not cause deficit financing. If it does cause deficit financing, it could be deemed a, a not legal contract. So that is really the school board's main role right now. Uh, and fourth, that this seminar provided further guidance on where to place uh, different types of language that were formerly included in teacher contracts but are not legally allowed to be included anymore. Uh, those are administrative guidelines, an employee handbook, and board policies. And there was some guidance of how to adjust those. But um, uh, we've taken some steps in our district there, and there was just further guidance on how to clarify that. Recommendations, guidance. And, and then finally, just a reminder that these are Indiana laws. These aren't Carmel Clay laws. Um, we have to follow these laws. We might agree with them. We might not agree with them. We might hope for change. We might not. It doesn't matter. But that um, this was guidance on how we and every other school district can follow these state laws. So thank you. That's my report. Thanks. Thank you, Tricia. Do either of the two of you have any, anything you picked up while you were there as well to, to add or no, a pretty good summary? That was an excellent summary. Well, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Dr. Wall, I think you had a few words to share as well. Yeah, briefly. Um, the DOE and Superintendent Ritz have issued some guidance as it relates to makeup days issued over the weekend. So this is pretty ripe item. The long, and so I'm not going to delve into the weeds on this tonight, but the long and short of it is, based upon what we know today, if winter subsides a little bit, which we would like it to, <laughs> we would have three days that we need to make up. We have stated in the three-year calendar that in the event makeup days are needed, they would be added on to the end of the school year. So as I've said in the spotlight a <coughs> times, we, have, we do not intend to make up any days on President's Day or the Friday before spring break or spring break because we've already sent a message to our, our parents and our faculty and staff if we need to make them up it'd be at the end. So we are looking at this new interpretation by the DOE in making up time. They've used this hour as an example and we've got, we received clarification today, Steve got clarification today, that's merely an example. They're not concerned with making it up in hour increments per day. They're just um, stating that whatever increments we think we might want to use need to be equivalent to the days that we missed, i.e. the three days we missed. And they're defining a day in this model um, as five hours for elementary, six hours for secondary. Our days exceed that already. So what we're looking at doing with discussions with our principals and association is looking at problem solving. What could that look like as we move forward that would meet the common interests that we all have? Increase instructional value the most we can prior to I-STEP and AP testing. Those are valued items. Um, not do it on Saturdays, not do it on Fridays before break, not do it on spring break, not do it on any of those times. But then also with a minimum uh, change to what our parents have to deal with and teachers have to deal with on a daily basis in regards to before and after school. So again, I'm not ready to say we have a solution because we don't, but we're pondering with that new guidance, what can we do that we can find a common interest for our parents, for our teachers, and for our student instructional time. And um, we look to get some um, agreement on that, really, this week. We, okay. we plan to unpack that with the association and with the uh, principals. And they're calling this a, what's the term they're using right now? Uh, it's a conditional waiver. Con conditional waiver. Okay. And they don't have it's not yet. the guidance on this. So as a board, I want to let you know we're looking at this. And um, it's not clear as to the procedures, but I want to let you know that I'll give you a report by week's end on where that status is. Because what we do know is to meet that interest of minimal impact, you know, maybe a little in the beginning of the day, a little in the end, 
we need to do this in a fairly timely fashion so we can do this, A, to impact our students' instructional time as expediently, expeditiously as we can because testing is coming up. And uh, B, we want to make sure that it gets us through the year. Mm -hmm. So look for that information in, in the very near future. And I think it really can meet that common interest of all of us in the room. So, yes. So we've missed five total days? We, we have missed, we've missed six. six. One, we've been granted a waiver for that January 8th. We already have 182 days in the calendar, so take those off, those three off, which leaves a net three left. So that's where we, where we stand right now. I lose track. <laughs> <One. laughs> so, a little sneak preview, and I know we have the right people this week we're going to be talking with to come to a common ground on that. Well, great. Thank you very much. We look forward to, to the outcome. Um, any other board members have anything they'd like to share this evening? Okay, well, I will thank everybody for a very comprehensive workshop. It was excellent, and um, thank you all for attending. We will adjourn our meeting.